Uh, several months ago, I had someone ask me this question, and this is what started kind of the journey for me of trying to understand this. They asked me this question, do you live a life of joy? That was the question they posed to me. Now, that's a weird question, right? That's a weird question to ask someone, uh, but I have a lot of weird friends, and so I had someone ask me that question. <laughs> you, you know weird people, you're going to get weird questions from time to time. And they asked the question, do you live a life of joy? And I had to step back a little bit, and there are some questions that people ask you you don't like to answer. That was one of those questions, because if I'm being honest, I don't always live a life of joy. Now, I have times of happiness. I don't feel unhappy. I don't live a sad or depressed life. I, I enjoy life, but do I really live a life of joy? If I'm honest, having been posed that question, I would have to say, not always. In fact, as I've tried to get my hands and mind and heart around this concept of joy, I've struggled even really to define what it is, to understand where it comes from, and, to know, and then to know how to live it out. Maybe you can relate. Maybe in your own life, you would have to say, I do a lot of things. I try to do the things that I'm supposed to do. I certainly do. I try to be faithful in what God has given to me. I try to be a faithful husband and a faithful father and, and good at the things that God has placed in my hand. I want to be a good steward of those things. But I would have to say, I don't always do those with joy. Often, I do those out of duty or responsibility, as if I'm the one who must carry the weight and am responsible for the success or failure of whatever that thing is. Maybe you live that way as well. Perhaps in your marriage, faithful, you work hard, you do the things that you're supposed to, but if you were honest, you would have to admit there's not a lot of joy. Maybe as a parent, uh, parenting has got to be the most difficult thing in the world to do if you're doing it right. <laughs> now, I know there are a lot of people who don't do it right, probably easy for them, but if you're trying to do it right, taking a child, raising them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, teaching them and training them and preparing them to go into a world that is going to throw so much negativity and hurt and brokenness at them and trying to teach them how they can navigate that in a good way. Probably, if not the most difficult, one of the most difficult jobs in the world is that of a parent. And perhaps in your parenting, you would say, I, I try to do right, I try to be faithful, uh, I'm engaged, I'm there all of the time, but there's just not a lot of joy. Not a lot of joy in my home, not a lot of joy in that relationship. It's right, but not joy-filled. Other areas of life, whatever those areas of life are for you, you're good at taking responsibility, you're good at doing the thing, but the thing, if you're honest, is wearing you out. You see, if we do right, even though it is right, <laughs> If we do our best to live out what God tells us to do, but we take that on ourselves, eventually the weight of doing right and the weight of carrying that thing is going to crush us. Because if we're doing that, the right thing, without joy, eventually we must come to the place where we admit, I can't do this anymore. And again, if I'm being honest, there have been many, many times in my life I've come to that exact spot. Is there sin? I don't think so. Unfaithfulness? I don't think so. A lack of character or determination? I don't think so. But I'm so focused on what I am required to do that there is also no joy in my life. I told you what I do when I'm trying to work through something. I prepare a sermon <laughs> or a series of sermons. But what all of us should do is go to the Bible and ask the question, what does God have to say about this? Thankfully, this is one of those topics that the Bible has much to say about, and I'm excited that I can share this with you today. And uh, for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be in this series for three weeks. And there's a reason it's a three-week series because pastor would only give me three weeks. That's the reason it's a three-week series. <laughs> he said, you have three weeks. I said, how about six? He said, how about three? I said, okay, I'll take five. <laughs> he said, you have three. I held up four, and he said, no, you have three. So my negotiating skills got us down to three weeks in this series. <laughs> but it's bigger than three weeks. 
So I'm going to ask you to stick with me today. Come back next week. We're going to walk through this together. And I want to tell you at the outset, this series is not about overcoming difficulty. It's not about overcoming trial and trauma. It's not about overcoming. Uh, We often hear messages on overcoming. I preach messages on overcoming. That can be very, very helpful. But if we're not careful, we can come to the Bible and passages like this and topics like this, and we can almost get into this uh, over-spiritualized therapy. (laughs) We need someone to help us from the Bible get to a place where we can overcome whatever it is we're going through in our lives. That can be very, very helpful. I'm thankful the Bible has a lot to say about overcoming. But that's not what this series is about. This is about living out the life that God has called us and created us to live. You see, living a life of joy shouldn't be only when there's difficulty and trial and trauma in our lives, although joy should be present in that moment. Living out a life of joy truly, and we're going to walk through this beginning today and over the next couple of weeks, truly is what we're called to do as Christians, a life of joy. Our circumstance, our situation, our past, whatever's happening in the world, whatever's going on in our relationships, none of those things should dictate to us whether or not we live a life of joy. Now today we're going to ask the question, what is joy and how do we define it? That's a good starting place. But this series is not about overcoming a difficulty. This series is about asking the question, how would God have me to live every day of my life? We'll start this morning with the the verse that really serves as the springboard for this passage or for this uh, for this series book of Nehemiah old chapter uh, old testament book of Nehemiah chapter number 8 if you have your bibles you can go to Nehemiah chapter 8 this morning this verse and all of the verses that I will reference today will be on the screen so you can follow along please take notes please write some things down save them so you can go back and look later be prepared next week <laughs> Think, let God speak to your heart, and determine now that you'll respond as he does. Nehemiah chapter 8, I'll begin just with this one verse, verse number 10, and then we will uh, look at what's happening around this verse as we work through today. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10, then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You ever heard that verse before? You've certainly heard that phrase before, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Maybe you've heard it misquoted, the joy of the Lord is our strength. (laughs) Either way, it gets to the heart of the same issue, that there is joy that comes from the Lord, and it is to give us strength. Now, I would encourage you to do this when you go home. Open up as many commentaries as you can find, and have someone explain to you exactly what that phrase means. You're going to have a hard time. (laughs) You're going to have a hard time. How do I know this? Because I've done it. So many things we throw around and we say, we, we hang on to, even though we don't really understand what they mean. The joy of the Lord is your strength. What exactly does that mean? That's where we'll be the next three weeks, and it has three parts, so it works out really well. There is joy that comes from the Lord that gives us strength. But today we're going to begin with understanding what exactly we mean when we talk about joy. Zig Ziglar said famously, you can't hit a target that you cannot see, and you cannot see a target that you do not have. How many of us are not living lives of joy because we've never designated or understood exactly what the target is? Today, we will begin, first of all, number one, a life of joy, a life of joy. This is a good place to start. I think many of us think that we don't have joy in our lives because we cannot have joy in our lives. It's interesting when you talk to people who are not believers, who are not Christians, and and maybe someone here today today is is in, in that boat trying to figure it out and trying to understand it. Joy is what attracts people who are not people of faith to faith. It's not happiness. We make a mistake when we tell young people, and we do this, and particularly if we have teenage kids, we make a mistake when we tell kids that they cannot be happy apart from God. 
Now stick with me for a second. (laughs) The world is full of happy people. In fact, if happiness is all you want, if you just want to be happy, if you want to deaden those thoughts that come up in your mind and the doubt and the fear and the anxiety, if you want to push all of that aside, you can find a way to do that. Happiness is not what attracts people outside of the church to the church. Happiness is not what attracts people who don't know Jesus to Jesus. And yet somehow we try to communicate that the only way to be happy is understanding who God is. There are a lot of ways to be happy, but check this out. There's only one way to have joy. Happiness is not what people are looking for. What they're looking for is peace and direction and hope and confidence and victory. They're looking for something that's so much bigger than temporary happiness because when that happiness wears off, whatever provided it is no longer there, that void is filled with anxiety, fear, desperation so often, and absolutely a lack of joy. You see, it is joy that is attractive and should be attractive in our lives. It's what so many are missing, but it is what God promises to those who have a close relationship with him. I'm going to read a series of verses to you this morning. I love this. What does God want for you? This is the question we all ask. We begin in Psalm 30 and verse 5. For his anger endureth but for a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. In our lives, there will be times of difficulty. Peter certainly talks about this in the New Testament. There will be trials and there will be tribulations and there will be difficulties. But the promise from God is that on the other side of all of that, there is joy. Psalm 126 and verse 5, they that re- or are sow in tears shall reap in joy. There is joy. Psalm 33 and verse 1, rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Psalm 97 and verse 12, Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Philippians 3 and verse 1, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Philippians 4 and verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, where we'll be next week. Week, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and it goes on. This is what God promises to those who are in relationship with him. Joy. I love these verses. I'm so thankful for these verses. I'm thankful for the songs that we sang this morning. To be able to say, it is well with my soul. Where does that come from? Because we live in a world that cannot say, it is well with my soul. Temporary moments of happiness, uh, things that divert attention. But to say it is well with my soul, that comes from a different place. And God tells us in his word that where that joy comes from is a relationship with him. We then go to the great example in the Bible, our only example, that of Jesus Christ, our Savior. He is the example for all of life. And in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for what? The joy that was set before him, what did he do? Endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That verse should knock you down. <laughs> Looking unto Jesus, our eyes are are fixed on Jesus. We're going to follow Jesus. What does that mean? It means we pursue that which is before us, even if it's the cross, the death and the difficulty, the creation throwing rocks at the creator, the creation saying crucify him. And it says that in all of that, our Savior Jesus was filled with joy. Can you say that you have that kind of joy this morning? I'm thankful that the Bible teaches us that the Christian life should be one of joy despite circumstance. But I have to then ask the question, if this is what it's supposed to look like, what's the problem? (laughs) What's the problem? You ever read verses and you go, wow, I believe the Bible. I'm just not sure how that's supposed to work. 
we read all of these verses, we go to the Psalms, we ask God to speak to our hearts and to encourage us. The Bible tells us there is joy and there should be joy. Uh, we come to the New Testament, we understand there's joy as we pursue Jesus. He is the one we are supposed to follow. He exam uh, provided an example. He modeled that for us. That's how we should live. We go to Ephesians 5, or Gal Galatians 5, which we'll talk about next week. The Bible tells us that comes from the Holy Spirit of God. Why do we struggle so much? That leads me to my second point, the problem. <laughs> You're following along? Not a big surprise. That's the second point. There's a promise of joy, but there is a problem with joy. We go to our passage again. We come, come to Nehemiah chapter 8, and if you know the story of Nehemiah, uh, absolutely amazing story. If you don't, start reading in verse number 1 of chapter 1. Incredible story. It's a story of God working in hearts and lives, of God moving the hearts of kings, God bringing the miraculous together. The city of Jerusalem had been burned to the ground. The walls were destroyed. Uh, many of the people had been taken into other nations in exile. God worked to bring a team together. And in the process of only 52 days, those walls were rebuilt. We come to chapter 7 and then into chapter 8 of Nehemiah, and really this is kind of the after party. The walls have been rebuilt. God has done the miraculous. The people who had no home are now living inside of the city, and the preacher gets up and begins to read the Scriptures. As he reads the Scriptures, the Bible tells us there was rejoicing and there was an overwhelming feeling of God's work in their lives. But as they come to this verse, verse number 10, The thankfulness, the gratefulness, the understanding of how good God is, the joy and rejoicing of being a part of a miracle, all of that is pushed aside with what the preacher here in verse number 10 calls sorrow. You see, as those folks stood and listened to Scripture being read, they were filled with an understanding of what they had allowed to happen. The city of Jerusalem, given to the nation of Israel by God, was destroyed because the people who had been there, the Jewish people who were there, appointed to care for it, did not. The walls were knocked down and destroyed. This was something that the people of God allowed to happen. The scriptures had not been read, and now that they're being read, they understood not only what they had allowed to happen, but who God was and where they stood before him. They saw uh, and now clearly their sin before God and their lack of worthiness, if you will, before him, that he is holy and they are not, and yet he loves them in spite of that. They could have been singing this song this morning. He's good. He's always good. But in contrast to the goodness of God, they saw their own lives of brokenness and hurt and sin. And although they had been a part of a miracle, they were now filled with sorrow. Have you ever experienced anything like that? Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul who was living for God. He was a man who accepted Christ under extreme circumstances, began to travel the world preaching and teaching the truth of the gospel. For his trouble, he would be rejected, he would be arrested, he would be stoned, he would be beaten. Eventually, he, he would lose his life as a martyr. And in the midst of all of that, doing the right thing, living for God, doing what God wanted him to do, we have Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not that I do. <laughs> That's a confusing verse, right? Here's what he said. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't do it. I won't ask for a show of hands. <laughs> but I think we all know what that's about. 
Verse 20, now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. He, he says, when I read the Bible, when I understand what God wants me to do and how God wants me to live, all I can see is not the goodness of God, not the blessing of God, not the greatness of God, I can see the holiness of God, and in contrast, I can see my own sin. Verse number 20, 24, he says, O wretched man that I am, <laughs> who shall deliver me from this body of death? The Apostle Paul, this giant of the faith, this guy, I'm sure he had some shortcomings in his life, but overall, he was doing what he was supposed to do. He was starting churches. He was uh, teaching other people. He was being used of God to write these, these book of Romans and these letters that would be used later on to encourage the rest of us. He would eventually be martyred for the cause of Christ. And his conclusion, when looking at his life, was, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Does that sound like a life of joy? does not. There are three things that get in the way of joy in the life of a believer. Sorrow, <laughs> sin, and self. Sorrow over what could have been, what I should have done, what I didn't do, we might call that regret. Sorrow. I think when we look at the folks in, in the book of Nehemiah, they were struggling with sorrow. When we look at the Apostle Paul, he says, I do so many things wrong. There's so much sorrow. When we look at our own lives, if we're honest, we can talk about sorrow and regret the stuff we should have done or the stuff we shouldn't have done. We live in a world that says, have as much fun as you want to, do as much stuff as you want to, it's going to be okay, you're only young once, and we carry then all of that regret into the rest of our lives. Perhaps we said or did something in a relationship that was harmful. Perhaps we said or did something as we were raising our kids that was not helpful. Perhaps in every other area of our life, we have those moments that our brain will not release that causes sorrow. And instead of looking at God, we begin to look at that sorrow, that regret, and that pain. There's sin Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. I think the folks in the book of Nehemiah looked at the Bible being read and understood, we're sinners before a holy God. The devil likes to get us so caught up in the sin that we've committed, those areas that we've fallen short of God's glory, short of God's word, short of what God wants us to do. And I don't have to convince anyone in this room that we sin. We go our own way, we do our own thing, we know what God wants, and we do something else. That's sin. And the devil gets us so caught up in that sin, he convinces us that God is not always good. He convinces us that we cannot say, it is well with my soul. He convinces us that John 3.16 does not apply to me. He convinces us that our sin is bigger than anyone else's sin. Our sin drives us deeper than we could possibly escape. Our sin has a hold on us that we could not get past. We come to the conclusion, as Paul did, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And so as Christians, forgiven, we're so focused on our sin that we don't live a life of joy, and then there is self. A realization of our lack of perfection and goodness. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> we want people to think we've got it figured out, but we don't really have it figured out. And if you think you have it figured out, we need to talk after the service. We're our harshest critics. We know where we fail. We know where we're not smart enough or capable enough or whatever. We get so focused on that regret <laughs> and that sin and ourselves that we may be doing what God wants us to do, but there is absolutely no joy in our lives. 
I've had times, as hard as it is for me to admit, that I've lived right there. I knew I was doing the right thing. But I was so caught up in my own shortcomings that there was no joy in the life of serving God. I love that Paul ends by declaring that he's a wretched man <laughs> and then pivots in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There's a distinct moment that happens between the end of chapter 7 and the beginning of chapter 1. I won't pretend to know what was in Paul's mind. He was preaching a sermon. I think he may have been reflecting and then projecting. But there's a distinct moment that happens between chapter 7 and chapter 8. Here it is. It's the moment of looking at myself and then looking to God. Paul declared when looking at himself and looking at Scripture and contrasting his own life to what the Bible says that he is a wretched man that needs deliverance. But when he takes his eyes off of himself and instead turns his eyes to God, we get these words in chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I could go on through this whole passage down to verse number 7. I'm not going to read all of this, but verse number 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. He takes this pivot. He says, what I was understanding about sin and what I was understanding about my sin nature in chapter 7 and the necessary deliverance, I came to understand that God had provided that deliverance. And when I put my trust in Him, when I put my confidence in Him, when I made the decision to focus on Him instead of me, on him and what he had done instead of my shortcomings and my failings and my frailty, then I was able to find my identity in what was completed on the cross. And in that, there is hope. And in that, there is joy. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, you know this verse, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This is a promise written by the same guy who said, O wretched man that I am. <laughs> First Corinthians 15, he closes up by saying, We know that as we live for God and work for God, our labor is not in vain. There is joy. So we see the promise we are to live lives of joy. We see the problem, <laughs> self and sin. But we come down now, number three, to the definition. So when we're talking about joy, we understand that God promises it to us. We know that we are so consumed often with ourselves that we don't experience it, but that we should. We come then, finally, to a definition of joy. How do we define joy? What exactly is it we are working toward? What are we talking about when we talk about joy? In the program that I use to write out my messages, there is now, brand new, an AI function. Anyone played around with AI at all? It's pretty weird. <laughs> it's kind of fun. So I had my message done. I'm letting you know that up front. I had my message done. <laughs> But the AI thing came up, and so I hit it just to see what it would come up with. And it gave me a definition of joy. I want to read that to you now. This is from AI, the AI writer on my program. And I quote, A life full of joy is like a never-ending symphony of happiness and contentment. That's how you know I didn't write this. <laughs> day after day is marked by genuine laughter and heartfelt smiles, brightening even the dullest moments. <laughs> It's hard to read this without laughing. Relationships are nurtured, bringing forth endless love and deep connections. Each morning is greeted with gratitude as the sun's rays dance upon a soul brimming with pure bliss. <laughs> I could have started there this morning and we could all be home already. <laughs> now, as I understand AI... It goes into the internet world and it draws all of the information available to it and it puts it in a way that we can understand it. This is what the world thinks about joy. The endless bliss 
waking up to a new sunrise in the morning, our souls brimming with pure bliss, defining joy is a little bit like defining a color to a blind person. (laughs) Define, explain what yellow looks like. It can be very difficult, but it's really important that we understand what joy is, the target that we are trying to hit. I want to give you a definition. It's very simple. I'm going to ask you to think about this over the next couple of weeks. But joy defined, as I understand it from Scripture, is this. Joy is the outward expression of a life of faith. Joy is the outward expression of a life of faith. It is how we respond to focusing on God instead of focusing on us. It's what we see in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, as opposed to the end of Romans chapter 7. Joy is the outward expression of a life of Faith. I want to work through this, but understand, this can affect our emotions, and sometimes it does. A life of faith, confidence in God, understanding He's bigger than us, and He's bigger than the world, and He's bigger than the system that we're in, and He is always good all of the time. That faith, that confidence, that hope directed at God produces joy. That joy sometimes has an emotional response Perhaps as you're listening to a song like the one we sang today or the others that we sang that we participate in, there's an emotional response to that. So settled in understanding who God is, it brings about an emotional response. Certainly it can. It can drive us to physical action, a hand, uh, some other way that we express that joy, that confidence in God based on faith in our lives. It causes us to be kind to others from a pure heart. You see, faith is the belief, confidence, and hope that produces joy. Faith is the belief, the confidence, and the hope that produces joy. This looks different for each person, of course, and will look different even from one season of life to another. But Bible joy is the fruit of a life of faith. I was trying to work through an illustration of this. And I thought about a phrase that's often used when you see a child playing. You might say something like, they're so full of joy. The younger the child, the more joy. (laughs) Isn't it amazing to see a little kid play, particularly in their own home with their own toys, There's so much joy. What is that joy? It's a life. It's an expression of what's happening on the inside. It's them living out a lack of fear, a lack of anxiety, and a confidence in their provider. They're not afraid. They're not anxious. They sometimes get angry because they're little kids and they're sinful and evil. But when they're not doing that, They are living out a confident assurance, a faith in their parent. Unbound by fear, regret, anxiety, and turmoil. And when we are living lives of faith, confidence and hope and assurance in God the Father, then we as his children need to do the right thing and live the right way and be what he's called us to be, but with the confidence that he's God, he'll bring his purposes to pass, and we can be settled in our relationship with him. The world seeks for happiness. What God offers is joy. Happiness is from the outside in. Based entirely on our circumstance, we try to find peace by manipulating our environment. Joy affects the outside from within. It's an expression beyond ourselves of what's happening in our hearts and our minds before a holy 
God. The book of Romans chapter 8. Paul goes on after he talks about being in Christ. Verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Love God and are the called according to his purpose. We know there is faith. It, it talks about being ones who are pursuing God, called according to his purpose. And, and in that, we can have a confidence that all things work together for good. If we ran down to verse number 37 of Romans chapter 8, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. A life of faith moves us from, O wretched man that I am, into an understanding that there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ, to an absolute assurance that there is nothing in this world or beyond it that can separate us from the love of God. That is joy. In the next few weeks, we'll continue our series. Next week, talking about the source of joy. And finally, we'll look at a life of joy, how we live that out. But today we ask the question, where does it start Joy is the outward expression of a life of faith. The starting point is faith. It's putting our focus on Him and then living a life unbound by fear, regret, anxiety, and turmoil. So many seek joy in every place except where it can truly be found. <laughs> Not by working harder, but by trusting God and His Word and then living it out. I love these words in Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 16. Jeremiah declared, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah said, The joy came when I consumed your word. And we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith is the starting point of joy. So my question for today is very simple. Before we move on next week in our understanding of this very important topic, where are you looking? Are you looking at yourself, your circumstance, your situation? <laughs> your sin, your regret? Or are you looking at God who is bigger than all of it? Joy is produced in the life of a person whose eyes are fixed on God. Lord, we thank you today for your love and for your goodness. Thank you for the opportunity to look into your word. spend a few minutes asking the question, how can we live a life of joy? What does it even mean to live a life of joy? Where does that come from? I think so many of us are doing the right thing and we're doing our very best to be faithful and consistent, to work hard. But if we were confronted with the question, do you live a life of joy? If we were honest, we'd have to say no. I'm doing the right thing. I'm technically right. <laughs> There's no joy in it. Because even as we do the right thing, we take the responsibility for all of it on ourselves. We're looking at us instead of you. God, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. Next week, we'll come back together and we'll consider the source of joy understanding that joy is produced through your Holy Spirit. So God, I pray that today every person in this room would understand, first of all, that the life of joy is a life that you've called us to live, that it is possible, and that it flows 
from a place of faith. Please work in our hearts and work in our lives today. Thank you for watching today's service. It's our prayer, whether you're a friend near or far, that today's services were a help and encouragement to you. If you'd like to get more connected with us, stop by our website, or maybe you have a prayer request or a question that we can help you with, feel free to drop us an email. Again, these services are designed to help you encourage and grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. If we can ever do anything for you, please let us know. And it's our prayer that we'll get to worship with you again soon.